learning in a community. It's wonderful, it's marvelous. Uh, so I'm Vibash Naidu. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Science of Facity, as well as at Our Ladies Josie. So who am I? I'm a nerd and a proud R loving nerd at that. Uh, I'm co-organizer of Our Ladies Johannesburg and on the Africa R uh, leadership team. Um, so some of you may already know what R is and some of you may not. So I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of R and Our Ladies so that you know what it's about. Uh, so R is a programming language and people often refer to it as a statistical programming language. Uh, but I think it's evolved way past that. Uh, for example, I've seen games actually programmed in R and the ecosystem has evolved so much that now you can use it for in multiple disciplines. And I would argue it's a very nice language actually for people from different disciplines, especially for analysis purposes and for reproducible research. So Our Ladies is an organization dedicated to increasing the gender diversity within the R ecosystem, whether it be for just using the R programming language or for your analysis and for reproducible research or for um, actually going further and maybe presenting your research at conferences for sharing your work via blog posts and um, books even you can even create books using R. Um, and also even further, if you want to actually build packages. So packages are like these little self-contained units that kind of enhance the R ecosystem. And then lastly, I'm a mom. And as you can see on the far right, that means me um, traveling to some far out places because my kid's still quite young. So who are you? I think you're on a journey and that journey is in this vast new world um, and it can be quite daunting. I think you also love technology. So you probably love technology and the increased productivity it's given you, as well as the increased connection with people near and far. But perhaps some of you, if not most of you, feel like this digital divide is already so wide and you're struggling to make that, that jump to becoming a maker. And when I say maker, you have people who use technology and already all, all of us are doing it to increase our productivity. But then you can get that extra boost if you're actually using programming languages for your analyses, for your reproducible research. And it just gives you that little extra edge. Um, or uh, as we've seen in the poll, some of you have already said challenge accepted and you're you're closing that digital divide already and you're looking for a safe space to grow and to learn and to get stuck in. And I think you're needed. You're needed in tech spaces quite desperately, um, especially people from social sciences and humanities uh, to shape the future of this space. I don't think it should be left up to just people who have a tech kind of background. Um, you need to bring your ideas and your knowledge and your empathy to these spaces. So my journey into tech started off pretty rough, uh, but it actually ended up quite like a love letter. Um, so I actually went to university to study chemical engineering and I failed technical drawing. And I was also not doing very great in other subjects that are usually my forte, like um, mechanics, which is highly mathematical and with some physics involved. And I was quite good at physics and maths at school, but I was really in a bad space after my first year of university. So I decided to change degrees. It was quite a difficult decision to make. I mean, I'm pretty sure many of you who have ever been in that situation will understand. Um, so I was strong at maths. I knew that would be one part of my, my um, 
degree. But then at the same time, uh, computers and programming was becoming quite a big thing and also uh, starting to become a prevalent like vocation. And I didn't have any background at, at high school in uh, programming. So I decided though, let me just try uh, computer science one. And I fell in love with it almost immediately. I felt like this wizard who is also this detective as well. Like this gave me this huge power, like this superpower. And I also think it spoke to the lazy part of me because automating things freed up time for other passions. And I love that code could do that for me. Uh, I do often joke with my team that I got into this vocation because of laziness. And I still think that's true, but for the sake of have, having a good spin on it, let's, let's call it my drive for efficiency. But little did I know that that was just part of the hurdle. Getting through uni was just one part of the hurdle. The tech world, to put it mildly, is not inviting for women or minority genders. And if you can't see the little picture at the corner, it says, we are open, the door is just very heavy. And that's how tech spaces often feel. It feels like a brotopia. And as a woman of, uh, as a woman or minority gender, you often feel like the gif on the left, where Judy is sits down and she just disappears. And you, um, you do, while you don't want it to be like the gif on the right, like you looming over everyone, you kind of want it somewhere in the middle. Like you want your voice to be heard, and you want to be um, in a space where you can actually drive the agenda there. Um, but let's not pretend my for your foray into uh, tech and digital spaces is going to be even harder than mine. So my vocation was computer science. Your vocation is usually something else like anthropology or e ecology or marine biology. And then tech is now this extra thing that you have to learn to actually get that step up and um, be able to do your main love. Um, so I, which is why I would encourage you to actually join communities, to learn in a community. So these spaces truly feel like there's no stupid question. And it feels very less lonely when you're learning with other people. Uh, you also find people being very vulnerable and that gives you the opportunity to be vulnerable as well. And you'll find a lot of people from like non-tech backgrounds learning out loud and doing incredible things with programming because they're combining their humanities and social sciences background with um, like programming to actually produce analysis, to do research and to build products that ultimately I would say benefit society. So I would love if you join our ladies um, as the community, but there's many other communities that could be more suitable for you. Uh, as an elder said, there's the digital humanities like Slack, Slack space, and that's being uh, co-created now with you all, which is quite nice. Like you're, you're developing it as you're going along. Um, then there's also the carpentry. So uh, Angelique will, I think she's up next week and she will talk about the some part about the carpentries, but that's a very safe learning environment. And they used a lot of uh, cognitive science and the way we learn to structure their material. And it's also very friendly for people who are just beginning in this space. Um, there's also the R for data science community. So that is an R community and you can, it's a very nice community though. It's very welcoming, very warm. You can join a book club and you can um, meet with people in um, like the EMEA region. And that's quite nice. You make some new friends along with actually learning a skill and you learn with people who's also learning. So you don't feel so bad about asking questions and um, it's, it's a safe space. So what are the benefits of learning in a community? So I feel you learn for free. So on my previous slide, I didn't go through it, but I've heard these spaces being called free night school. 
and it is it's like free school for you you're learning an extra skill along with people and you get to see mistakes that other people make and learn from them you make your own mistakes other people also learn and you learn as well you meet people from different backgrounds you can also get a job uh, in our ladies we've had quite a few job opportunities um, result in actually people from the community being hired into those roles you can find a mentor if you're early career or you can be a mentor which is also good prep for leadership later on um, you can talk through usually hard to talk about subjects um, like uh, how do you negotiate for a salary uh, how do you uh, turn down something how do you say no how do you make space for your time uh, things like that is once you get safe environment it's easier to talk to those things as though you're talking with a friend you can apply for diversity scholarships so uh, our ladies in particular help you with um, applications for like conferences also for learning opportunities they will critique your application and help you get through that it's a very safe space for like dry runs of upcoming talks that you may have to give uh, further. And then later on, once you're in that community and you have you feel comfortable, a lot of people will approach you to give talks at conferences, to host conference uh, sessions, uh, to co-organize a conference. So I co-organized, I was one of the organizers of the USR 2021. And that was a very nice opportunity, but also a very um, cool one because I got to meet a lot of people. And I would say that you also, once you get to that stage, it's a nice opportunity to give back because it's like the circle. You learn a lot and you kind of just learn, learn, learn. And then at some point you kind of reach a threshold and you're like, I've learned so much and now I'm ready to give back. And that's quite cool. Um, the main things I would say about learning in a community is you feel supported and you feel inspired and you feel uplifted and you really feel like you found your village like yeah and and especially for me you or a lot of you are youngsters so you may not have the same problem but as an adult it's hard to make friends but I feel like I've found this tribe and I've made these friends these new friends even though they may just be Twitter friends so that's my my little um like that was a very much a highlight for me. And are there any downsides to learning in a community? So if you suffer like me from social anxiety, then it can be daunting to find any safe space. You worry about many different things, right? You worry about, like for me, for example, I worry about my conversational skills, my likability, my knowledge. So it's it, there's a lot of things that you worry about. For me, the pluses still outweigh the minuses and which is why I get out there and I do it. Um, and I hope that you will too. So you may be thinking everyone knows more than me. Uh, and I mean, social media and technology, the downside of it is that we're now exposed and compare, we compare ourselves to like millions of people out there. And at times that can be very demotivating. Um, but I would say that you should always try and remind yourself of the cartoon by Liz and Molly at the top corner of the screen. So it says, don't measure yourself by someone else's ruler. And I think that's very appropriate to try and keep in mind. It's not always possible, but try and just keep it in mind. Everyone's on their own learning journey and learns at their own pace. And we are in a new uncharted territory with having access to millions of people, tiny bit that they show us on social media, which is usually only the good parts. We don't see the rest of it. And we compare ourselves to that. And often every one of us is not perfect. And we're often failing in one thing or another. And that's okay. We're allowed to fail. And um, so this also on the left is a tweet from the we are late we are our ladies rotating curator account and they did a 
did a like a poll and arguably it's not a lot of people but out of 54 people most people didn't have a programming background um, and I thought I should just put that there because we do need those people in that space and they're actually driving the agenda for the R ecosystem as well. And then on the right is a tweet from Renee, which is also, um, it's more about how different backgrounds result in a data scientist. Um, I, there's just a snippet there, but you can click on the link later on and have a look at like, it's quite inspirational. There's people from economics, from education, from psychology, etc. And I love this artwork by Alison Horst, the one on the on the right, like learning in a community does make you feel heroic, you feel like you're doing so much like wow I'm doing this all on my own, but actually you're doing it with this huge support system under you, and that is very reassuring. Um, on this page, I've just got a couple of suggested follows. So this Twitter for our programmers and Twitter for scientists is two books that you can read to you. How do you leverage Twitter to kind of um, learn, like to use it as a learning platform. And in my opinion, lots of people are using Twitter for learning and for teaching, especially in the R community. And it's lots of people are also learning with vulnerability. They're saying, for example, today I learned there's a hashtag TIL and hashtag how to or also mistakes that I made um, because we all make mistakes and it's quite um, I think it's good to actually put your failures out there as well but you when you're starting out I would suggest just watch these people because they've established themselves before they started posting and you should only post when you're actually feeling safe to do so because there's not always nice people on social media and it can be very discouraging if you put out some post about something that you're super proud of and somebody is very discouraging of it. Um, then there's also the hashtag tidy Tuesday on Twitter. That one is more for data visualization, but there's a lot you can learn there, like how to wrangle data and what to do if you have missing data. So there's a lot of uh, opportunities for learning just above, over and above data visualization. Um, then there's Slice, that's a new one, it's on Twitch. And it's actually a data science competition that is sort of like chopped, um, but for data science. So contestants get this data set and they have to work with it in like a few, uh, in two hours, I think is their deadline. But you learn a lot about that as well. How to look at your data, what sort of things should you keep in mind? What sort of modeling techniques will actually be appropriate for this sort of data? Uh, that's quite nice. Um, then there's also a learn with, um, so this is Jessie um, Akiracy, I don't know how to pronounce that, but she's also learning out loud, um, which I really love, um, and she's very, she puts out um, material like starter material for Tidy Tuesday, which is also quite good. Um, then there's black in data for um, people, black people who are in uh, the data community and it's very inspiring. Most profiles are from the US, but there's quite a lot from Africa as well. Um, so have a look at that. Um, and then Tanika, uh, what I like about her is she's putting out a lot of um, um, like little links where you can get free education or free learning if you're a minority uh, or a rep under representative group within this community in a tech community. Um, so my acknowledgements and thank you. Um, so these are just you can read through them. Um, and then there's just a few extra resources from our ladies itself or from our the our community. And then that's it from me. So I just want to say thank you for the time and for listening to me.